Hello, my name is Siri Tellier and I am an external lecturer with the Copenhagen School of Global Health and the topic of this session is migration. When you hear the term migrants, often discussions focus on one particular kind of migrant. Migrants are actually a very varied group. I've been a migrant most of my life, possibly you have too, and therefore what I would like to do in this session is to open up the discussion about the different types of migrants and analyze what their very different conditions are with respect to health, including the frameworks that are in place to protect their health. So let's begin with the term international migrant. This is a term usually referring to persons who are residing in countries other than their country of birth. The number of international migrants was estimated to be 231 million in 2013, and that was about 3% of world population. So it's not a very large proportion. And in fact, the proportion of total population has stayed rather constant over the last decades. And indeed, if we go further back in history, for example, to the 19th century, several countries in Europe saw up to a third of their populations emigrate, for example, uh, to North America, seeking better economic opportunities or freedom from persecution. So international migration is not new, and neither are the motivations which people have for migrating. What is changing is the direction of the migration. In recent decades, the proportion of international migrants who migrate from less developed to more developed regions, what on this slide is called south to north migration, has increased but it's still only about a third of all migrants, that is 35%. Another 34% migrate among countries in the south, and 25% migrate among countries in the north. So south to north migration is only a third. With respect to age composition, a large majority of international migrants, around 72%, are prime working ages from 20 to 64. The median age is 39, which is actually a little bit older than the world average. Part of the reason for that is a statistical problem. Children born to migrants in their country of destination are not counted as international migrants in accordance with the definition that I just gave above. However, on average, migrants are of working age and therefore also of the age where economic productivity is high and health is relatively good. The one issue where they may have more need for health care than other age groups is reproductive health care, which is particularly concentrated at those ages. However, again, international migrant is an umbrella term covering many different kinds of groups with very, very different health situations and protective frameworks to help them with their health. One of those groups is refugees. The estimate by the United Nations is that there were about 20 million as at the end of 2014, a number which has grown quite a bit since 2011. There is a relatively well-developed framework for protecting their health, for example, the 1951 Refugee Convention. There are also organizations which are specifically charged with helping them, such as the UN High Commission for Refugees and the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestinian Refugees. But otherwise, they are fairly well addressed, as it were, in international frameworks. Other groups include asylum seekers, that is, people who have applied for refugee state, uh, status, uh, and they are estimated at around 1 million. These numbers are changing by the day, but that's what they were now. And stateless people who are estimated at around 12 million people. However, if we turn to undocumented migrants, some of whom were trafficked, they face very special challenges. Numbers of for trafficked persons vary, with one recent estimate around 27 million. Although trafficked persons in principle are also protected by special conventions and regional agreements, they often live, by the nature of their work, under the radar with little access to healthcare. Similar considerations hold for others who are undocumented. For example, some domestic workers who may be working in families without the benefit of public workplace scrutiny. 
And as mentioned in the beginning, international migration is not very large scale, accounting for only about 3% of world population. But let's now turn to internal migration within countries, which is where you see enormous movements of migration. The megatrend, the sort of thing that dwarfs anything else, is rural to urban migration. The world's population is predicted to increase from the present of just over 7 billion to around 9.6 billion by 2050. However, in more developed regions, the richer areas of the world that is, both rural and urban population is expected to stagnate. In less developed regions, the poor areas of the world, rural population is also expected to stagnate or even to decrease. But the population which is expected to grow dramatically is urban populations of less developed countries. In fact, almost all population growth in the next decades, that is 2 billion people, is expected to happen in urban centers of less developed regions. So, that, so then what are the health implications of this mega shift and what are the implications for protecting the right to health? One aspect is that at present about one billion or one third of world urban population is living in slums and many recent migrants to urban areas settle into those slums. Not all slums are health hazards but in terms of water and sanitation they can present great challenges, very different challenges from the more affluent areas often right next to each other as in this photo. Although such migrants who come from the rural areas to the urban areas in principle are protected by the laws of their country, some urban migrants are not covered by the same health and education privileges as persons who are urban residents. For example, that has been the case in China uh, for the rural to urban migrants who still retain their so-called huko, that is identity card. Then they do not have the protection from the urban areas. There are also other kinds of internal migrants who face special challenges. The term internally displaced persons or IDPs has received much attention in the last two decades. Estimates are that as of the end of 2014, there were close to 40 million persons internally displaced within their own country, only counting because of conflict or violence. This conflict that they have experienced may be with the government of their own country, and therefore IDPs may not be willing or able to seek protection from the government, including in the area of healthcare. And although a set of guidelines has been developed two decades ago, and although, for example, the African Union has formalized those guidelines, this group of people, the internally displaced persons, remains very difficult to identify and to protect. However, those displaced by conflict and violence are not the only persons who are internally displaced. Recently, in the last 10 years or so, there has been increasing attention to persons who have been displaced by disasters, either sudden onset, such as earthquakes or hurricanes, or slow onset, such as riding, rising seawater or drought. The term climacrants has been coined to refer to these persons. Estimates from the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center, which is one of the few that actually have numbers of these things, indicate that around 42 million people were newly displaced by sudden onset disasters, mostly weather related disasters, in 2010. The numbers fluctuate from year to year and methodologies are as yet being developed, which makes projections very unstable. For example, estimates for, from different organizations for 2050, projections that is, vary between 50 million and 20 times that many. That is just to indicate the difficulties in estimating the number and makes any kind of action planning very difficult to do. But this is an area which could potentially have great impact on future global health and what we do to protect. It will be a question not only of what numbers are displaced, but also the conditions to which they move. For example, this is a photograph from Cotonou in Benin showing recent uh, migrants who are settling in rather vulnerable housing close to the water where they're exposed to f um, uh, slow onset rises in the water levels as well as sudden onset storms where those who are more fortunate they live in safer housing up the hill. Thus, to repeat my suggestion from the beginning of this session, 
when considering the health of migrants, it's very important to recognize the great differences which exist among the different groups of migrants, and this is also reflected in their health conditions, as well as in the possibilities which we have to address their health. It's also important to note that data on migrants are particularly challenging and difficult to assemble. It's just difficult to count somebody who has left. There is great need for further research into the field, and I do hope that some of you will conduct such future research.